My name is Yuki Shiraido, Assistant Professor of Political Science and a member of CJS, and I am the host today. Before introducing today's speaker, let me make an announcement from CJS. Next week on Thursday, March 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Friday, March 18th at 8 a.m. Japan Time, please join us for our next CJS lecture by Sachiko Kawaii, Project Researcher and Assistant Professor, National Institutes for the Humanities, National Museum of Japanese History, Japan. The title of the lecture is Uncertain Powers, Senyo Mongin and Land Ownership by a Royal Woman Women in Early Medieval Japan. This event is co-sponsored by Medieval and Early Modern Studies. For this event and the future programs scheduled in this series, please check out our CJS events page or various social media. Now, let me introduce today's speaker, Professor Yusaku Horiuchi, Mitsui Professor of Japanese Studies and Professor of Government, Dartmouth College. Professor Horiuchi received his PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2001. Since then, he taught at the National University of Singapore and Australian National University, and he moved to Dartmouth College in 2012. His research interests are in comparative political behavior, international public opinion, comparative political economy, and electoral institutions, many of which focuses on Japan. He has published numerous articles in top political science journals, including American Political Science Review, American Journal of uh, Political Science, uh, journal of Politics and Political Analysis. Today, he discusses his recent work on electoral competition in Japan, focusing on policy platforms and party competition. In this webinar, attendee webcams and microphones have been muted, but we invite you to use Q&A function to submit any questions you have. You can submit your questions anytime and after Professor Horiuchi's presentation, I will, ask his, I will ask him your question on your behalf. With all that, um, please join us. Uh, please join me welcoming Professor Horiuchi. Yusaku, the screen is yours. I think you're muted, Yusaku. Okay, yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Uh, I think we are seeing uh, some notes and next okay. slides. Swap display. Yes, this okay. works. Good. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Yuki, for your kind introduction. And thank you, uh, CJC, uh, for, um, for organizing this uh, seminar. So it is my pleasure to present my recent work. Uh, which is a joint project with uh, Shusei uh, Eshima, uh, Shiro Kuriwaki, and Dan Smith. Um, and then the title of this presentation is Democracy Without uh, Policy uh, Competition, uh, Voter Preferences and a Single Party Dominance in Japan. So this paper is about Japanese politics and uh, it, uh, the dominance of Japan's ruling party, the Liberal Democratic Party. And this figure uh, shows uh, the, the vote share, uh, the seat share of Liberal Democratic Party uh, since, uh, in, since the mid 1980s. And then as you can see, LDP has won uh, more than 50 or around 50% of seats in most of the elections. And uh, except 2009, in which uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, DPJ, had a landslide victory, LDP essentially has won uh, the majority of seats, or almost the majority of the seats. And particularly uh, after LDP came back um, in uh, 2012, uh, LDP's uh, the seat share is 
comfortably uh, greater than fifty uh, percent. So sixty about sixty one percent in 2012, 14, and seventeen. And then 2021, uh, the most recent election at the end of October last year, the seat share was 56. But uh, then in, in a sense, the LDP lost some seats, but still LDP uh, had, a, had a majority of seats. And uh, this uh, LDP dominance is puzzling for those who are familiar with Japanese politics or comparative politics, electoral politics, or those who are familiar with the electoral reform uh, in 1994 in Japan. So in 1994, the electoral system was changed in, for the lower house elections from single non-transfer vote system, SNTD system, to a combination of single member district system like the one used in the US and uh, the proportional representation system. I don't explain the technical details, but uh, one of the main discussion uh, about uh, discussion made at the time of this debate in 1990 was to change Japan's party system from LDP dominant system to more to part to the political party system with two large parties competing based on the policy platforms. And, uh, but the fact is, it is still dominant, actually. And then as, you, as this video shows, particularly uh, since uh, 2012, LDP is even more dominant compared to the, the dominance uh, uh, before 1994. And so, so that's, that's, that's what, what, I, what we want to explain. And then I would argue that this is perhaps what, one of the most important puzzles or the questions that anyone interested in Japanese politics uh, want to, to examine uh, in empirical research. Now, so this LDP dominance is puzzling. Uh, I, I intentionally use the word question and the puzzles because uh, this research question, what explain LDP dominance is also not just a question, but it's a puzzle. The reason why we, I say this is puzzle is because LDP uh, cabinet, uh, the LDP governments are not necessarily popular. So this figure, uh, based on the uh, one of the major newspapers in Japan, Nikkei, Nikkei Shinbun, shows uh, public support for cabinet uh, since uh, Koizumi cabinet to uh, Suga cabinet, which is uh, the previous cabinet. And then the first, uh, the top part shows percentage of support. And then bottom part shows percentage of not support. And then as you can see, you know, with the, the uh, horizontal lines, percentage of support is around 40% and percentage of not support is 50%. Okay? And then uh, these lines shows minimum and maximum. And then uh, the triangles show the average. Now, the Koizumi, uh, when he be, uh, became the pre, uh, prime minister, he was so popular. So percentage of not support was uh, below 50%, and then percentage support was about 40%. But uh, roughly across those you know, uh, administration, the percentage is uh, about the same. And then there are three uh, Hatoyama uh, cabinet, uh, the Hatoyama Kan and another cabinet under the DPJ regime. And then after DPJ's fall, Abe uh, became uh, the prime minister. And as you know, uh, he was prime minister for many years. And then uh, Suga became uh, the prime minister. But uh, even though uh, after LDP's return uh, uh, from uh, return to power in 2012, even the number of seats is like 60%, percentage of support is not that high. So what explained this LDP continued dominance? So that's the question and the puzzle. There are several Japan specific explanations like clientism and organized votes, uh, electoral alliance with Kometo. LDP has been, uh, uh, has formed uh, coalitions with the same small coalition partner Kometo. And some argue that this coalition is important factor explaining uh, LDP dominance. 
Some people say that credibility advantage or just simply there is no alternative to LDP. And then other, say, other people say that opposition parties are so fragmented. We still have so many small oppositions and they, don't, they, are not, they have not be, uh, become a viable, viable large alternative to LDP. So uh, in this presentation uh, and also in our paper, we don't, we, I don't, uh, we don't focus on those Japan explanations. And then we want to step back and think about LDP dominance a bit more uh, from, from a theoretical perspective, which is policy. Okay? Think about uh, the, the politics in general, not just Japan. Okay? And then parties uh, win uh, in elections and uh, lose in elections. And then in the democratic system, uh, the political uh, scientists uh, tend to assume, and also the, uh, the political commentators, journalists, and the general public tend to think that the party wins based on policies. And then party lose when the, the, that incumbent party's policy uh, becomes uh, uh, not, uh, not favorable among uh, the voters. So does LDP's continued dominance suggest that Japanese people like LDP's policies? So that's the fundamental question we want to examine in this paper. And in Japan, uh, since uh, 2000, I think nine or seven, I forgot the exact year, but uh, Japanese uh, political parties uh, started uh, preparing uh, so-called manifestos. These are policy packages or the policy bundles, and they prepare uh, nice pamphlets and then circulate uh, among uh, the voters. And a, and a PDF version, uh, version of those uh, the manifestos are also available from their party's uh, website. And then uh, they, these are the, actually the, the cover page of uh, manifestos in 2021 election and uh, by LDP and uh, some other parties. Okay. So we use uh, the policy information uh, included, uh, discussed in those uh, manifestos, and then we administered so-called uh, conjoint analysis. And then uh, the period of this survey experiment is from October 19th and 30th. And then this is actually the period of electoral campaigns. Well, well we started like a day after, and then we uh, opened the survey until the morning of the, the election day. Okay. And then, so in this experiment, we use the actual policy manifestos and then we filled the experiment during the election campaign and I tried to understand Japanese people's policy support. And then we use uh, the company called the Qualtrics Panels. And then uh, uh, we collected uh, nearly 4,000 responses uh, from everywhere uh, in the nation. And then because we use uh, so-called uh, demographic quotas, uh, the sample we obtain uh, is reasonably representative. And then uh, this is a technical part, so I don't explain the details, but uh, we added uh, a range of uh, the techniques and, and the questions in order to um, keep the high quality of survey responses. Okay, so, so I will explain the conjoint analysis uh, uh, now, but before explaining uh, the, the design itself, I want to show you an example of tables, policy tables that Japanese people often see during the campaign or even before the, just before the campaign period start. So this is, uh, uh, I, I just uh, took a screenshot from Yomiuri uh, Shinbun, another uh, nationwide newspaper, uh, just a few days before the campaign uh, period began. So this is October 17th. And then this summarizes uh, the parties, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six major parties' uh, positions on major policy issues. So one is uh, coronavirus measures, and then another one is economic policy. And then the third column is about uh, the diplomacy and uh, international uh, security, foreign policy. So this is just one example, but uh, there are many tables like this uh, 
generated. I mean, uh, many newspapers and even non-profit organizations or some researchers, they tried to summarize uh, policy positions based on the manifestos and then allow, uh, give an opportunity to, for voters to compare the policy positions across different political parties. So that's what actually uh, people do, the newspaper do, and then people uh, see and then compare the policies. And, uh, and uh, in our conjoint experiment, we did something very similar. So this is one example of an another screenshot from, uh, that I took uh, from our survey. And we showed two hypothetical parties. Party one, Seto Ichi, party two, Seto Ni. And then uh, these are the two columns. And then each row corresponds to each of the major policy uh, issues uh, at stake during the 2021 elections. So nuclear power and energy, uh, diplomacy and national security, diversity and a symbiotic society, and coronavirus policy and an economic policy. And then uh, the, the contents of the table uh, are randomly generated uh, based on the actual policy uh, proposals by uh, the, the major political parties uh, campaigning during the, during the campaign period. Okay. So these are the hypothetical combination of the policy positions to generate hypothetical political parties. And then we asked which party would you support, party one or party two. And then we asked a respondent to repeat this exercise uh, eight times, pull all data, and then apply a relatively simple statistical uh, method in order to understand which attribute, which policy issues are most important uh, for voters. And then uh, within each policy uh, issues, for example, coronavirus policies, which parties' positions are more favored by uh, Japanese voters compared to others. And I'm going to show you those results using uh, a, a figure. Okay. But before uh, showing the results, uh, I want to explain LDP's policies. Okay. LDP's uh, coronavirus, uh, the policy is disseminate oral medicine by end of year. Amend law to curb flow of people when a state of emergency is declared. Economic policy, financial support for non-regular uh, workers, women, households, raising children, students, and so on and so forth. Diplomacy uh, strengthen Japan-US alliance and a defense capabilities, uh, obtain capability to in, uh, intercept missiles in outside territories. Okay. Uh, fourth major policy, nuclear power and energy. This has been the, the major issues uh, for many years. Restart nuclear power plants whose safety has been confirmed. Promote nuclear fusion uh, development. And then lastly, uh, I personally think this is actually an interesting uh, issue that became at stake, uh, diversity. As you know, the diversity, inclusivity, equity, and belonging are uh, you know, so important uh, in American politics, American society, and then also American higher education. And, uh, and uh, other than the, the, my research about Japanese politics, I have a uh, new uh, set of research about diversity. And actually I even wrote a book about the campus diversity. So uh, I personally think this is really interesting. I think as far as I know, uh, this is the first time in Japanese political history uh, that uh, the diversity became one of the major issues in national elections. And then LDP's policies uh, was uh, was this, uh, promptly uh, implement parliamentary legislation to promote understandings of LGBT issues, support women's economic independence. Okay. And then these are the policies by the DP. And then we similarly uh, prepared uh, the policy positions for uh, Kometo and Constitutional Democratic Party, uh, Japan Communist Party, Ishin no Kai, and the Democratic People's Party, uh, the major parties uh, running candidates uh, in the 2021 election. 
Now, so here's the results. Uh, this figure uh, is showing uh, so-called average marginal component effects. Uh, I skipped technical explanations, but uh, let me try to explain uh, so that you can understand what this figure is showing. Okay? So uh, horizontal axis shows the effect uh, or compared to LDP's position. So if uh, position, so LDP's position uh, policy is a baseline, and then compared to LDP's baseline position, if hypothetical political party, hypothetical manifesto includes position by, for example, Kometo, how much, how likely uh, can uh, the, the survey takers choose that profile? Okay. So because LDP's positions are the baseline, all of these dots you know, you know, on the left-hand side of the vertical line at zero indicate that LDP's policy are more popular. So because compared to LDP, uh, other parties' policy, policy positions are not favored, uh, negative effects. But if these dots uh, point estimates are uh, above the zero, meaning positive, that actually means compared to LDP's position, uh, other parties' uh, policy positions are favored by Japanese voters. So let me explain uh, some of the interesting findings. The first one is uh, COVID-19 measures. Okay. As you can see, there are not much differences uh, between positions by uh, those major parties. By the way, each uh, horizontal line uh, attached to each dot is 95% confidence interval. So if this 95% uh, confidence intervals include zero at the vertical line, that actually means there is no significant difference between that position and the LDP's position. So uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 policy, uh, most, of, most uh, opposition parties' policy positions and also comment position are uh, not significant different from LDP. But there is one statistically significant one, which is uh, CDP's position, just a minute, CDC's position, which is this. All people entering Japan should be quarantined in hotels for at least 10 days. Okay? This is unpopular about among Japanese, uh, Japanese people. But as you know, until uh, recently, uh, Japan maintained a strict policy uh, or, uh, with regards to this. So, so that's interesting finding. I, I thought this is interesting finding. The second one, uh, diversity. Okay. And then compared to the LDP's position, which I just uh, showed you, uh, positions by all the other parties are significantly positive, meaning uh, these positions are significantly more preferred by Japanese voters. And then many of them, most of them actually say, uh, say that Japan should allow married couples to have separate surnames. That's strongly preferred significantly preferred by Japanese voters. Now, third one, economic policy. Okay, Economic policy, uh, the, there is one uh, which is uh, negative and a large effect, which is uh, Kometo's policy. Provide uh, 100,000 yen worth of benefits for children, uh, zero years old to third, third, year, third year of high school. And interestingly, as soon as LDP won and, and as soon as LDP confirmed a coalition with LDP, uh, Kometo, this quite unfair, you know, disfavored policy was the first policy LDP tried to uh, implement it, uh, tried to, and then actually implement it. Yeah. And then what about the other parties' uh, uh, po uh, policies on economic, uh, economic issues? And then, uh, except uh, CDP, uh, those dots are positive and statistically significant. And, uh, and they tend to, uh, those parties uh, say that the consumption tax should be lowered. 
Now, energy, uh, all of those dots are positive, and then again, statistically significant, meaning all of these uh, parties' positions are more preferred than LDP's policy on energy and the nuclear power. And then all the parties except LDP essentially say there's no more genpatsu, meaning they are uh, critical uh, uh, in the use of nuclear power in Japan. Now, finally, uh, security and national uh, uh, security and the diplomacy. There, there is one uh, uh, exception, uh, one significantly uh, preferred the policy, which is uh, by Japan Communist Party. And then Japan Communist Party says uh, Japan should abolish uh, Japan-US uh, security treaty. So that's the, 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 that's, uh, the interpretation of all of these results. But an important point uh, that I want to highlight uh, using this figure is there are many dots on the right-hand side. Uh, there are many dots which are positive. LDP policy is less popular. Okay. Uh, but as I have repeatedly mentioned, LDP won a comfortable majority of seats. And then, and then actually another thing I should mention is this conjoint experiment uh, during the campaign, this uh, 2021 is our third attempt to understand policy preferences among Japanese voters during the campaign. So we did something quite similar in 2014, and uh, we published a paper from political analysis. And then we, uh, we did uh, something similar in 2017, and then the third attempt, 2021. So we are writing an academic paper uh, using uh, data and then results from not just the 2021, but also 2017. But uh, the point is LDP uh, won uh, in all of those elections, but in all of those elections, LDP's policies are not necessarily the most preferred among Japanese uh, voters. So that's a puzzle. So why LDP uh, is st still so strong? So in 2021, we did something that we didn't do before, which is to understand party label. Okay, so we estimated so-called the party level effect. Well, here's one example. Actually, it's the same one. Uh, you have I have already shown you that the first column is party one, and the second column is party two, and then randomly generated a uh, random combination of the policy positions to generate uh, hypothetical uh, party manifestos. And then our respondents are asked to choose which party would you support, party one or party two. Now, so something that we did in 2021 is after we asked respondents to do this exercise eight times, I think eight times, uh, we said, uh, now, please repeat, uh, uh, please uh, continue this exercise. But then we said, uh, we added party level, okay? So uh, exactly the same table, okay? The contents are exactly the same, but in the second round, uh, one of the columns is always LDP. And the second column is one of the other parties. Uh, in this case, Ishin no Kai. And then uh, instead of asking uh, which party uh, would you support, hypothetical party one or hypothetical party two, we specifically asked, uh, would you support LDP or Ishin no Kai? Okay, so this is uh, experimental uh, manipulation in order to understand how much parties' labels actually change the way in which uh, survey takers should preferred policy bundle. Now, here is the main result. Okay, so we estimated the, the change in probability of choosing party bundle. Okay, and then as you can see, uh, once LDP's label, the name Jimin Jimin Shito party level is attached to that, that one of the columns, then Japanese uh, survey takers were much more likely to choose that particular uh, policy bundle. And then uh, similarly, uh, the, all of these uh, negative uh, results for Komeito, CDP, JCP, and Ishii, and DPP suggest that when 
uh, part, the label of other party is attached to another column, then uh, uh, survey takers are less likely to choose the column. So people choose uh, columns based on party name, not necessarily by the policy content. Now, so we can also examine this party level effect for uh, every single uh, policy position. Okay? So in this experiment, we chose five major policy areas, as I have already explained, coronavirus policy, economic policy, diversity, nuclear power, and then uh, national security. And then uh, it, uh, the vertical axis shows LDP's position, COMETO's position, CDP's position, JCP's position, Ishin's position, and DPP's positions. Okay. And then this set of uh, dots, this is slightly different from the figure that, that I showed. This figure shows so-called marginal means. Okay. So there are two options, party one or party two. So the pro if respondents choose one of those or just based on, uh, you know, choose at random, then the probability of choosing that particular profile is 50%. Okay, so we are looking at the deviation from the 50%. Okay, and then this set of the figures in gray are without party label. Okay, but if party level is attached, then uh, this marginal means probability of choosing uh, the policies uh, that include that particular part, uh, particular uh, a chosen party's position significantly increase. And then the third column showed uh, the differences. All of these are positive and all of these are statistically significant. Now, uh, because there are uh, so much information in this figure, so let me focus on one of them, okay? This is about diplomacy and the national security. And I have already mentioned that there is one policy which was so unpopular among Japanese voters, which is, Jap Japanese Communist Party's policy, which is abolish Japan-US uh, uh, security treaty, conclude a Japan-US friendship treaty, shift to disarmament, and then oppose capability to attack uh, enemy bases. Okay, this is significantly uh, not preferred among Japanese people, but even when this uh, JCP's position is included, in the table, once LDP's pa uh, LDP's party label is attached to that column, then Japanese people are more likely to choose that particular policy bundle that includes JCP's position. And then effect is statistically significant. So the party level effect is in short, so large. Now, so, I have already presented uh, uh, these, these results uh, previously at several different seminars, but uh, we, we got uh, the comments and the questions, uh, which is this question. So what explains the party level effects? Uh, so uh, last uh, several weeks, uh, we did some more data analysis, and then we are now in the process of trying to understand uh, the determinants of this part, large LDP party level effect. And then uh, we show, uh, I show some results of a simple uh, regression analysis. Now, the determinants uh, we considered, um, we have a survey uh, with 4,000 4, respondents. And then in this survey, uh, we asked respondents to do conjoint exercises, showing tables and then asking them to compare two parties. But we also ask a range of questions that may be relevant uh, to understand Japanese politics. So the first set of questions we ask is trust. Would you trust LDP? Uh, how, and actually not would you, but how much uh, do you trust LDP? Uh, and then also uh, we ask a question about trust of the prime minister Kishida. Uh, because you know we, the trust is perhaps one reason why LDP's party level is uh, so powerful. Okay, when they see the name LDP, uh, they think, well, this is the party we can trust. So regardless of the policy contents, 
they support. But uh, alternative explanation is LDP is likely to be perceived as a party which is credible. Okay? Compared to other parties, LDP may be perceived as the party that can make and implement policies that Japanese people prefer. So we ask a question about credibility. Okay. We also ask a standard set of questions about uh, job approval or job performance of the cabinet. And then uh, we ask a range of questions uh, about specific policies, like oh, uh, uh, would you support, for example, uh, how much do you support Kishida cabinet's uh, performance with regard to economic policy, foreign policy, or coronavirus policy. Okay, so we ask those uh, uh, perceived job performance of the, the, the current the cabinet. We also ask a range of questions asking, what did you consider uh, when, you made, when you made your vote choice? Uh, actually, this is actually, sorry, to be more precise, because we did this study before the, 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 the election day, we said, we asked, which of those following would you consider uh, to make your vote choice? And then, like, for example, uh, Hitogara, personality of candidate, Jimoto no Rieki, local benefits, and uh, uh, parties, and some others. Okay, th th this sort of question has been used in so many. Uh, the previous uh, uh, election surveys uh, fielded in Japan. Okay. And then uh, for this particular study, we also asked how much they are familiar with policy manifestos. I mentioned that the policy manifestos are summarized in table format by newspapers and some other organizations. And then uh, these tables are available in many different, uh, through many different channels uh, before and during the election campaign. But people may just not familiar with those manifestos or they may not be uh, familiar with the differences between those manifestos. So we asked the questions about the familiarity of manifestos. Now, one important advantage in our survey is we asked uh, the, the location of each respondent. So we specifically asked which region do you live? And then for example, uh, Kanto area, and then another question pops up, which particular prefecture do you live? And then let's say you choose uh, uh, Chiba prefecture. And then the next question appears. And then uh, which particular is a single member district, uh, district, district uh, uh, your municipality is located? And then we show a list of uh, single member district within that particular uh, prefecture with the names of the municipalities belonging to each electoral district. So we are able to match some of the, uh, the municipality level statistics at the level uh, we, can we can aggregate some of the uh, municipality level uh, statistics at, at the electoral district level. And then we can match uh, the electoral district level data to uh, with our surveys. And then uh, one important uh, variable that many of uh, many people who gave comments, uh, some comments to, uh, to us mentioned in the context of Japanese politics, uh, hojoking, intergovernmental fiscal transfer should be definitely important. And then I do have a paper about the, in the impact of intergovernmental fiscal transfers in Japan. And uh, Amy Katalinak at NYU has a bunch of papers uh, focusing on how much intergovernmental fiscal transfers shape Japanese uh, politics and Japanese economy. So we merged the data and then uh, uh, we merged those uh, uh, yeah, fiscal data with our survey. And then we also asked a bunch of other demographic and economic indicators like population size, population density, uh, per capita income and some others. Now, so using uh, all of those uh, the variables, uh, we estimated which of those variables can predict uh, the party level effect. Okay, the party level effect uh, is something that we can measure at the level of each 
particular survey respondent because we asked uh, each respondent to do the conjoint tasks eight times and then eight times again with party level. So we can actually measure how much the, uh, the change each respondent made uh, in their choices. Okay? And then if, let's say, if some, some participant may choose the policies which are not attached to the uh, LDP in the second stage, but in the second stage, all of those, uh, they chose LDP. That's an, one extreme. Another extreme is in stage one, they chose particular profiles which are not attached to LDP in the second stage. Okay. But no, just a minute. Attached to the LDP in the first, uh, sorry, it's get first stage. Uh, suppose that a person choose, chose uh, the, the columns which would be attached, uh, LDP policy uh, party levels are attached, would be attached. But in the second stage, uh, they chose uh, parties without LDP party level. So anyway, so there is a variation in the LDP uh, party level effect uh, across those respondents. And we use that as a dependent variable. And then I use all of those variables as independent variables, estimated effects using a regression analysis, and then standardized effects to compare the magnitude of the effect. Now, here's a result, okay? Uh, this is actually a surprise. Uh, we thought maybe uh, intergovernmental fiscal transfers or some questions like jimoto no riiki, the local benefits, or kohosha no hitogara, the personal characteristics of uh, candidates. We thought those could be important, but most of the variables were not statistically significant. Okay? And then we found some significant effects, which are highlighted in red. Uh, job performance of COVID policy makes sense because COVID uh, was the, the most important policy issue at stake in 2021. And candidate job performance leadership, uh, that's also significant. And then I considered party support, uh, that's also significant. But the most important one is uh, trust in LDP. Okay? Uh, we used so-called standardized regression coefficient to uh, compare the magnitude of effects. And then this figure shows trust in LDP is by far the most important and uh, the powerful predictor of LDP's uh, party level effect. Now, so let me conclude. So the, there are three points uh, I want to highlight uh, based on my research. The first is voters' policy preferences are not necessarily uh, voters' uh, the vote choices. Okay? Based on the results of election, uh, political parties, party leaders, and even newspapers say that uh, after observing LDP's landslide victory, for example, uh, they tend to say that voters support LDP's policies. But that's not what we find. Yeah. The, the voters' policy preferences and the, vote, uh, the actual the vote choices are not necessarily uh, associated in Japan. Second, uh, this research finds strong party level effects. We, uh, we st still don't know uh, what is the most important uh, uh, source of this strong uh, party effect effect, but our preliminary analysis suggests uh, trust matters. People trust in LDP for whatever reasons. So when they see the name Jiyu Ninshito in the table, regardless of the policy positions, they support. So that's what the survey takers did in the survey, online survey. But uh, we also uh, uh, argue that Japanese voters they perhaps do something similar at the, the polling booth. So they choose LDP, not after comparing policy positions across different parties, but they just choose LDP because they think LDP is trustworthy uh, relative to other parties. So what does it mean? So 
uh, we think LDP is likely to stay dominant, uh, but that doesn't mean uh, voters policy, uh, uh, the, the, the LDP uh, gain a strong policy support from voters. So, um, well, we still have uh, the questions that we must answer, but these are the, the conclusions uh, drawn from this research. So uh, that's about 40 minutes. So thank you very much. And I just wanna say that uh, I wrote an article in Nikkei Business, uh, Japanese, uh, the magazine at the end of uh, December last year. So this talk today is in part based on uh, this article that we I, that I published in Nikkei Business. But uh, this Nikkei Business article didn't show the, the results of uh, the regression analysis uh, examining the origin of LDP party effect. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yusaku. Um, that was that was very, very interesting, uh, interesting talk. Um, so we already have a few questions from the audience. So let me uh, let me begin with the question about the the uh, the last part of your uh, lecture, which is about the trust in LDP. Um, uh, Ken Coleman, a professor of uh, political science here and the director of the Center for uh, Political Studies, is asking. Uh, this is really terrific work and very interesting. Uh, could the trust be similar to the idea that on the issues the voters think is most important, they trust the LDP? In other words, you know, can you compare across the issues in terms of the importance of issues in driving vote, driving the vote? Like, the trust in the LDP might be fear, might be fear of the other parties on just a few issues like the defense agreement. The JCP is is proposing to abandon the U.S. Japan Security Alliance. Hmm. Um, you know, everyone. Well, I wouldn't say everyone, but the the, the vast majority of Japanese voters don't like it. Um, I think so. That's I think uh, can can means that you know the. They, they, they might, they, they might be afraid of yeah. other parties doing something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas, whereas people trust in LDP that they don't do crazy things. Yeah. So he just, he just added another sentence. In other words, trust means trust that the LDP has the right priorities. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's good. That's really good point. And uh, I think. That is yes, and but uh, we haven't tested uh, this argument. But uh, actually, we perhaps can examine this because this uh, 2021 uh, experiment survey that we fielded during the campaign, uh, I explained that uh, that conjoined uh, eight tasks uh, without party level and then eight tasks with party level. But we actually did one additional set of conjoint tasks uh, with the same, exact same, uh, the conjoint tables uh, that uh, each respondent saw. And then uh, the third conjoint experiment, which uh, we, I didn't mention in presentation, is we showed the exact same conjoint set of, set of tables. But uh, the third one actually asked which of those uh, policy uh, positions, uh, the po policy manifestos, do you think is closer to the actual policy manifestos by LDP? So we can actually measure uh, which particular policy positions are quote unquote owned by LDP. So it's uh, relevant to the literature of issue ownership or the issue position ownership. So for example, LD, uh, the uh, COMETOs and the JCP's uh, uh, the, uh, security policy, which is you know, they propose the abolishment of US-Japan security treaty, most likely when uh, the respondents see that particular uh, uh, policy position, then they think this is not LDP's policy manifestos. LDP will never add a policy position like this. 
Okay. So we, we have those results to, and then we also have the actual choice. And then we also ask a question about LDP trust. So interaction of those three perhaps can be used to understand uh, trust affects uh, the choice of profiles with LDP uh, label, particularly when uh, that particular manifesto is perceived to be LDP's policies. Okay. So uh, it's not necessarily about the uh, priorities, but the effects uh, of trust uh, on, technically speaking, average marginal component effect can be uh, conditional on perceived issue ownership. So that actually, and we haven't done this analysis, but this is a really interesting point, and I definitely wanted to check this. So thanks for your suggestions. Thanks. Um... Another uh, another question. Well, uh, two two questions uh, from uh, Bo Yun Li. Uh, thank you for sharing the uh, the interesting research. Uh, I have two questions. Why you did not put the party label as one of the attributes, but decided to change the label for each choice? Uh, how does your approach differ from adding the party label as one of the attributes? And uh, did you two did you find any interesting differences by demogra demographics? Since I think the support for LDP would differ, especially by age. Mm -hmm, Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, so uh, yes, uh, adding additional attribute uh, in this conjoint, uh, it was another possibility. So add just a part party, uh, maybe that could be the first row of the conjoint table, but still ask, uh, respondents, which of the, the policy, posi uh, policy manifestos would you choose? Party A or party B or party one or party two? That is another design, okay? And then that is uh, uh, perhaps useful to understand how much party label effect, a party label compared to other attributes is relevant when they choose most preferred policy package. Okay. But that was not what we intended to estimate. So we wanted to show the exact same set of conjoint tables, but with party level. So it, the, the quantity of interest was slightly different. So we just wanted to directly measure uh, the effects of having LDP's party label okay, given the exact same con uh, uh, content. And then we specifically wanted to ask, which particular party would you choose by referring to those names? So that's a different design. Right? But the idea uh, is you know, quite uh, uh, you know, understandable and that actually is easy. Uh, that, that actually could be really important because for example, in the US, uh, we know that party uh, labels are so important. So if we were to feel something similar with policy positions and then party name, and then randomize everything, and then I asked uh, American citizens which, uh, which of these two uh, party, the two uh, policy manifestos would you choose? And then most likely they choose on the basis of the party. Okay? And then what about Japan? You know, doing something similar in Japan or maybe on, in other countries like UK or, or, or Canada or other countries. And then we can compare the relevance of the party level. That could be another uh, uh, potentially really interesting research. But as I, as I noted, that was not our intention. The second question. Uh, yeah. The demographics. The demographics, yes. Uh, we had, uh, we estimated uh, the effects like marginal, uh, average marginal component effects or more, more specifically marginal means across different uh, uh, demographics. And uh, we, see some differences, uh, but uh, uh, I, if, I, if I remember uh, correctly, we didn't see huge differences, particularly when it comes to the party level effect. So the, the party level effect is uh, quite uh, robust, meaning it's not uh, just among specific subgroups of Responders. So obvious, obviously, when you compare uh, LDP supporters and not LDP supporters, you see differences. 
But when it comes to demographics, I think that not the differences are not uh, substantial. But uh, I, I will definitely check. Great, thanks. Um, uh, I think uh, there is another question, which is I think this is this is more about sort of con uh, the current uh, current policy of the LDP. So um, Amy Dawson Ando is asking. So the LDP has added increasing diversity to their latest platform. I think this is uh, probably a little surprising. I guess. Uh <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's good question and uh the most the recent uh the manifesto was the manifesto prepared for uh, october 2021 uh, election so uh, since then there has been no update but uh in the next election uh you don't know uh my guess is Although uh, LDP's position on diversity is uh, not as preferred, not much as preferred as uh, positions by other uh, political parties, uh, I don't think LDP will change, adjust the policy position. I'm saying this because uh, nuclear power plants yeah, and uh, we did a uh, conjoint experiment in 2014, 2017, 2021. Uh, always, uh, we, when it comes to energy policy and the nuclear power uh, uh, policy, LDP's policy was the least favored among all the parties, always. Yeah. And then I guess LDP knows that, but LDP hasn't updated uh, the, the nuclear power uh, uh, New, uh, policies on nuclear uh, nuclear uh, power, given the policy preferences by Japanese voters. You know, similarly, you know, in 2021, uh, some of the policies which uh, were most disfavored uh, among Japanese voters were actually the policies LDP implemented. Right. So one is uh, well, actually the most uh, the mo the least preferred is. Uh, strict control of the influx of uh, foreigners and then even Japanese citizens. Okay, uh, Japanese voters didn't like that, but uh, the J Japanese government uh, maintained the strict policy until recently. And then Japanese voters didn't like the giving uh, 100,000 yen, uh, that is Kometo's policy. But as I said, LDP did you know, implement the, the distribute the money that uh, right after the elections. So interesting, another puzzle, you know, the one puzzle is why LDP is dominant, uh, although LDP's policy is not uh, favorable. But another potentially interesting pu uh, puzzle that scholars of Japanese politics or comparative politics in general may need to understand is why LDP doesn't change their policy positions in order to attract votes. The LDP may know that regardless of the policy positions, they win for whatever reasons. But then the question is, where does this strong trust among Japanese voters come from? That is still something I am not able to answer. So in short, diversity uh, with regard to uh, women's participation in any every aspects of Japanese uh, economy and society, uh, understandings of LGBTQ, and of course, uh, foreigners, immigrants, and refugees, all of these are the important uh, issues that I that Japan is now facing. And I personally have a strong interest in those issues. But uh, my guess is LDP will not make major changes in coming years. Sorry to be a bit pessimistic. <laughs> um... So actually, let me let me ask uh, uh, like my my questions or comments about the uh, the one of the point you just made. So, uh, you know, like why why LDP doesn't change their own policy platform mm. towards the the opposition party platforms because yeah. those are those are more liked. And and I was I was wondering. Um, 
so when when seeing when seeing the the conjoint profiles you used, I was wondering, you know, I mean, in in some in some categories, even though they are, yes, they are in the same policy areas, but mm. topics may be very different, right? So in the diversity issues, you know, LDP is mentioning LGBTQ. Mm. Uh, the other party, I mean, some other parties are mentioning uh, the Who's mandatory, the yeah. Yeah, mandatory same sur surname marriage. Yeah. Or like in coronavirus measures, uh, CDP mentions quarantine of entrance. Yeah. Other parties are mentioning domestic measures. And so, I was one. I was wondering. So, opposition parties are strategically choose those topics within the same policy areas, so that you know, even though I mean, they are essentially not expecting they will win, and and so they can they have relatively, you know, like freer um, room to sort of choose whatever seems to be popular but mm. maybe it's a little little unrealistic policies mm. like that was that was my mm. that was my wondering and relatedly mm. based on your estimates could you come up with any policy profile that can trump the ldp uh party level effect yeah um uh, <laughs> good good point uh, we, as you actually know, uh, this, uh, ex this project is, is becoming bigger and bigger because we, we have many experimental components and we can ask many questions. And then in uh, another presentation we made, uh, we did much more technically sophisticated approach. And then uh, I tried to estimate the probability of choosing a particular profile given a particular set of policy positions and then try to understand uh, this variation, heterogeneity among different uh, voters using, uh, you know, uh, uh, we apply a, a kind of machine learning technique and then estimate the probability using a multinomial choice model. So uh, it's, we do, we are able to do some sort of simulations comparing uh, LDP's probability of choosing LDP's policy platform with and without party level. And then the best possible combinations of the opposition political opposition's party platforms so that opposition could have won more seats compared to LDP. Yeah, we are, uh, we, uh, one of my calls has actually did this. So uh, for all of those opposition parties, for all of these five major positions, we chose, uh, we chose the largest average marginal component effect. Does this make sense? So for each uh, attribute, we chose the one that has the largest average marginal component effect. And then for all of those political parties, party level effects, they tend to be negative, but we chose the smallest uh, party, the negative party level effect. And then we combined. Okay? And then I compared uh, with uh, probability of choosing LDP's uh, policy. Yeah. And then we found LDP still wins. <laughs> so right. yeah, the regardless of the combination of positions, policy positions, LDP still wins. Uh, so that's that's a puzzle. I think we need to show these results in our paper. But yeah, that's very and, interesting. And, and you mentioned in earlier. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe uh, uh, Kuzushima-san also has a question, but. Uh, when when I when I presented this uh, for the first time uh, some months ago, you mentioned that the findings are not so uh, surprising because the in other uh, countries uh, like Japan, parties mobilize support based on the party labels. Okay, but uh, there is a similar study done in the United Kingdom. Uh, and during the campaign, almost the same design as ours. And then uh, I, don't, I forgot the exact results, but results essentially shows that average marginal component effect of other parties you know, using the winning uh, the incumbent party as a baseline are negative. To put it in a different way, the policies of the parties that won got more larger effects compared to the, uh, the policies 
uh, didn't uh, by parties that didn't win. So the policy preferences and vote choices are closely associated in the United Kingdom. But in Japan, very different. So where does LD, strong support for LDP come from is an interesting puzzle, an important puzzle we have to examine. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, Saki Kuzushima, a grad student in the Department of Political Science here, is, uh, has a question about the design and probably the cognitive burden of the respondents. Mm. Um, so media often create a table of policy comparison using in terms of simpler symbols, uh, mm. circle, triangle, uh, cross marks, and et, et cetera. Uh, do you think this kind of simpler way of uh, presenting policy differences across parties can change the result. Um, I asked this because the, the example description of the policies do not look very explicit and the respondents may not be able to decide which policy is better for them. I, I actually agree uh, on, I somewhat agree with, with her because like for example, the LGBTQ policy by the LDP, it says uh, they promote this particular uh, legislative bill, mm. but it doesn't specify the content of mm. it. And, and that bill is criticized actually mm. because, because of insufficiency of, mm. uh, of doing it. Yeah. So yes, uh, this is a good question. And uh, depending on how we design uh, the conjoint tables, the results could be different. And then uh, we acknowledge that uh, designing these conjoint tables is in a sense subjective because we uh, read policy manifestos and we check many summaries uh, pr produced by uh, various newspapers. And then I combine those and we chose the five policies that we think as the most important and relevant and issues at stake. And we tried to summarize each party's policies. Uh, we didn't do any computational, uh, apply computational technique to summarize the policy positions. So in a sense, this is subjective, but uh, the trade-off is the simpler, the better, easier for respondents to understand, okay? but. The, that also that could also you know oversimplify the complicated policy positions by political parties. Okay, and then uh, for example, Nikkei Shinbun, Nikkei, Nikkei uh, use one page or two page, uh, make a huge table with you know, so many words with small font to summarize each party's policy positions. And then. You know, it's hard to read and it's hard to understand the differences, but Nikkei's, uh, the, the, the style is to present the details and present the really, really tiny, uh, the short table, uh, which only highlights the main point. Uh, Yuki's gone. So, but anyway, so um, yeah, that's um, a good point. And then um, um, uh, I, I, I think the presentation matters. But uh, what we try to do in this experiment, actually in this series of experiments since 2014, is to use the tables that are often most likely seen by average Japanese voters. So they are, the, in terms of the number of attributes, in terms of the number of words, the tables that we use are similar to the tables that people actually see in newspapers. So in that regard, I think our experiment has some sort of uh, ecological validity or external validity. <clears throat> I actually wanted to talk about, uh, because uh, I think he's coming back and then, uh, uh, because I, I don't want to waste time. So uh, I wanna say that uh, the diversity, uh, particularly uh, Japanese people's attitudes toward refugee resettlement uh, is something I am uh, definitely interested in. And uh, the Japanese government uh, has 
severely restricted the inflow, the acceptance of acknowledging and admitting the uh, refugees uh, sponsored by uh, United Nations for many years. But the Kishida government just recently announced that <clears throat> the, the Japanese government will accept refugees from uh, the Ukraine. This is a big change in terms of Japan's refugee policy. And uh, I'm interested in doing something similar uh, with, uh, with regards to Japanese people's preference uh, for, uh, for the refugees or their willingness to accept refugees. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, because I, I got a question about the diversity. I just want to mention that that's another interesting project I'm working on. So you are back. Oh, you are muted. Professor Shiraito, you are muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, the the machine crashed, so I just uh, switched to another device and <laughs> turned on the uh, the Zoom. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we we got all questions, and uh, if there are no more questions, I think we we can wrap it up. And thank you very much, uh, Yusaku. And uh, there was a fantastic presentation, and uh, it was very interesting. Some some of the conclusions are a little pessimistic, but. <laughs> Um, but I think uh, knowing knowing pessimistic conclusion is better than not knowing it. So, <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Yep, and, thank you so much. And thank you um, for joining us all. Uh, so thank you to the audience for joining us. And thank, yeah, and thank that you. is it. Thank you.